Hi everyone, so we're just trying to continue now to get this book finished. I don't know how many more reads there are in it, but I'll keep uploading them. Hopefully um, they'll get put on the website for you. This is The Dream Snatcher, it's chapter 30, An Unexpected Discovery. It's time to go, Maul. Maul squinted into the sunrise, her ears filling with the taps of a nearby woodpecker. Oak was kneeling before her, a knife and a pistol tucked into his waistcoat, and a mug of dandelion tea in his outstretched hand. The camp were curled inwards towards the fire, even though it was now just a rubble of glowing embers. Children nestled close to their mothers, scooped into their chests like newborn puppies, and fully grown men stretched arms and legs around their families. Maul felt a pang of loneliness until Griff nestled his, her cheek before arching his back down to the ground in a stretch. Maul nudged Alfie awake. Get some clean clothes on, both of you, Oak said. Mushies laid them out just beyond the fire, together with fresh bandages for Alfie's ankle. Then, meet me under the sacred oak behind your wagon, Maul. Maul's shoulders drooped as she looked across at her wagon. The door was hanging from one hinge and the window had been smashed right out. She glanced back towards the fire where Siddy was sleeping by his paw. What about Sid? Oak shook his head. No, not this time, Maul. The more people we are, the more like it is we'll be seen. Maul was about to protest when Oak said, You need to wear the belts I've laid out for you. No questions. We need to get going. Minutes later, Maul and Alfie stood beneath the tree and Oak approached, carrying two sheathed daggers. He held one out to Maul and her eyes widened. It stretched from her wrist to her elbow and the sheath had been made from dark leather. It was scratched and scuffed and the initials FP had been stitched on with lighter thread. Very pecksniff, Oak said. That was your pa's dagger, Maul. A light knife with a, but a deadly blade. He looked down. It was my plan to give it to you when you were older, but it's best you carry it now. You might need it on this trip. After that, I want it back until you're grown. Alfie smirked. Grown? She'll be button size forever. But Maul didn't hear him. She drew the dagger from its sheath. The handle was made out of bone, and just before the blade it was bound with string. She held it tight as if she was holding her pa's hand. Careful, Oak said. That blade's sharp. It'd slice a man's wrist clean off. Maul gulped, and even Griff took a step back. Oak smiled. Your parents were honest and kind people, Maul. Your pa was big and strong, and he knew this forest better than anyone. He could track an animal by its prints for miles, and he could kill a rabbit stone dead with his catapult. And that's not to mention what he could do with this knife. As gypsies come, he was one of the bravest and most loyal any of us have known. And Mama? Maul asked. Oak ruffled her hair. Sometimes I think I'm looking at her when I look at you. She was small. So small, with hair and eyes just like yours. And she was as kind and funny and mischievous, like her daughter. Maul held the words tight while Oak gave the second dagger to Alfie. So you won't, you need to use your rings to cut. It was my father's, an ancient iron dagger, but it's the best blade you'll find. Alfie drew back the sheath, and the blade sparkled in the morning sun. It's shining, this is. Doesn't look like the ancient iron to me. Oak smiled. That's because it's made with moon silver. Moon silver? You never heard of moon silver, Maul said. That's because you're no gypsy. But your story's not a skull told you either, she thought. But she held her tongue because finding the amulets was now more important than the liar's skull might have told Alfie. For now. When the moon's full, we take our iron and copper out under it, Oak said. And we hammer it into coins, jewellery and daggers. Moonbeams sink into the metal and turn it to shining silver. It's real silver to us, moon silver is. Alfie let his dagger glide through the air. Its blade was so sharp that it seemed to slice the sunlight to slivers. As Maul tucked her back, hers back into its sheath, she noticed something else. Three feathers, a red, a blue and brown. Robin, Jay and Wren, she murmured. Oak nodded. Red for luck, blue for protection and brown for friendship. I put them inside each of our sheaths. Out of the corner of her eye, Maul watched Alfie turn the brown feather over in his hands and grip it tight. Oak reached into his pocket and tossed them two chunks of bread. Breakfast. We've got time. We haven't got time for no more. Griff wrinkled up his nose at the bread, but when no voles or mice appeared from Oak's pocket, he ate it. And there's something we need to do first before we look for amulets, Oak said. They stood round the sacred oak, Griff's whiskers twitch twitching at near silent sounds. A deer stepping in the leaves, dream catchers hung from low branches, their beads and feathers fluttering in the breeze. Oak pulled out his dagger and, bending beneath the dream catchers, he began cutting into the tree of a trunk. What are you doing? Maul asked, her mouth full of bread. 
oak had chipped out several small chunks of bar, leaving an arrow shape within the trunk, pointing towards the clearing. I'm leaving a pataran. A pataran? asked Alfie. Gypsy's traveller signal. Sort of like a trademark that gypsies leave to show they've been here and settled. You carve your initials next to the arrow and the number of years you've been here. Oak began to carve his initials. Moll beamed, delighted at the prospect of using her pa's dagger so quickly. But Alfie wore a very different expression. You don't think we're coming back, do you, Oak? He said quietly. Moll Mo stiffened, but Oak continued to carve. I want to believe we're coming back, but gypsy traditions die hard and I want to leave my mark, just in case. Alfie stepped forward and raised his dagger to the bark, but Moll pushed him back. No. Alfie reddened. Suppose I'm got right to carve your trees. Moll shook her head. It isn't that. She looked at Oak and then back at Alfie. I don't want you to carve that tree, and I won't be carving in it either, because we are coming back. All three of us. She looked at Oak's initial and scowled, even if Oak has gone and carved his stupid pattern. Pataran, Oak corrected. Moll glowered at him. The ancient wood belongs to us, and Griff was growling. He leapt in front of Moll, baring his fangs and scanned the trees. And then he turned back to the clearing, his head cocked to one side, charging towards them like a miniature bull with Siddy. Ma, Ma, you won't believe what I've seen. I found it. I know where the heart of the forest is. Mushy was storming across the clearing behind him, waving her tea towel like a wolf flag. Siddy, you come back here right now. What did your Ma say? Siddy ducked beneath the stream catches. You've got to believe me, Ma. I found it. It's true. Oak stepped forward. Siddy, you've got to stay with the camp this time. We'll get caught if there are too many of us. Mushy and her tea towel were getting close. Siddy shook his head. I were staying in the camp. Then I lost porridge the second and I went to search for him. Mushy stopped beneath the dream catchers and took a swipe at Siddy. Siddy sighed, sidestepped. And when I were looking for porridge the second, I found the heart of the forest. I'm sure of it. Mushy put her hands on her hips and Moll shook her head. You can't have done, Sid. Even the elders don't know where it is. Siddy's face began to crumple and then it hardened with anger. Just because I'm not an elder and quick thinking like some of them back in the camp with their fancy letters and long words doesn't mean I haven't got as much chance of finding things as they have. There was an awkward silence and Small thought about doing a quick burp to break the tension. But it was Alfie who spoke, avoiding their eyes, his hands in his pockets. He said, maybe we should just listen to what Sid's got to say. You all listened to me back when Maul got sick. Mushy tucked her tea towel into her apron pocket. They said better not involve those highwaymen chicken, Siddy. They followed Siddy across the clearing to the oldest and biggest of the sacred oaks, the one Maul and Alfie had hidden in the night before. It was so huge and ancient, it looked like the type of tree that might have existed even before time dawned or the earth began to breathe. Siddy pointed to the stump that jutted out near the bottom of the trunk. Coins had been slotted into knife slits made by oaks camps. See these coins? The ones we stick in to ward off evil spirits? Everyone nodded. Well, after I found Porridge the second, I was just slotting in a coin to help frighten off the shadow masks, and... Ma was good and ready to thump Sid in the head. Did he honestly think that the coin would ward off Skull and Hemlock? And I know you won't believe me, Sid added, but when I slotted the coin into the stump here, the tree, well, it groaned. He paused, waiting for a reaction. No one said anything. In fact, the silence was so profoundly awkward that Ma began to hum to distract everyone. It groaned, proper groaned, as if the spirit were alive. Siddy exclaimed, and I think it's something to do with the heart of the forest, what you've been searching for. Oak glanced at Mushy. It can't be. When you get on, Mush. Mushy eyed her tea towel. Griff stepped close to the stump. He looked back at Moll, who held her, his gaze. Then he looked at Siddy. Moll thought about it for a moment. Then she said, I believe you, Sid. Alfie threw up his hands. I was all for trust in Siddy, but you really think that the tree's been talking? Moll nodded. It has got a spirit. All the trees have. She paused and then under her breath she said, I suppose if they've got spirits, then there isn't any reason why they shouldn't talk. She turned back to Siddy. Put your coin back into the slot, Sid. He fumbled in his pocket, accidentally bringing out Porridge the second. Blushing, he pushed the bewildered earthworm back and drew out a coin. Siddy manoeuvred into the slot he'd carved. Nothing happened. Alfie rolled his eyes and Oak looked anxious to press on. And then it came, from somewhere deep, deep inside the bark, a low, tired yawn, like a heavy door opening for the first time in a thousand years. Siddy withdrew the coin and the yawn crumbled in silence again. 
They looked at one another's speeches, and then Alfie gasped. I can see a face. He said, then more confidently, Yeah, a face shaped like it into the bark, two eyes there. He pointed to two circular knobs protruding from the trunk, lines like wrinkles surrounding each other, and a nose. He pointed to the long ridge of raised bark beneath the knob-like eyes, and a huge great mouth, see? A large domed mark jutted out from the trunk and spilled down to the ground where the tree's roots started. A city eyes shone. Only the mouth isn't just a mouth, I don't think. It looks like it might be a door. Mushy frowned. Why is that? Siddy's pointed to the stump where the coin slotted into it. Because I reckon that that's a handle. Maul gasped. Why haven't we seen this before? Oak shook his head in disbelief. Things that are important are mostly invisible to the naked eye until you need them. It's the ways of the old magic. Here, take the coin, Maul. Mercedes suggested. The tree just groans when I try. Maul had slotted coins into the bark before, but nothing had ever happened. And so, not expecting much, she took Siddy's coin and slipped it into the tree. Once again, the tree groaned, its rumble seeming to wake the very roots buried beneath, deep beneath the ground. And then suddenly the bark stirred, the dome shape of the mouth quivered, and then it wriggled, and very slowly it creaked out towards them. Maul grinned. The old magic was fighting back now. They needed it. The door into the heart of the forest had been unlocked. Chapter 31. The Heart of the Forest It was dark inside, dark and cold, and as Marl had almost expected, the entire tree was hollow. The grey-brown bark twisted upwards into dizzying heights, but in the very centre of the oak was what Melantha had promised them, a well. Mushy looked at Oak, her mouth twitching with excitement. I'll go back and tell the others. You'll want the whole clearing guarded, Oak. He nodded. Make sure everyone is armed. Men and women, we can't let Skull in now we're this close. Mushy hurried away, leaving the dome door a fraction ajar. Shavings of light were slipped in, illuminating City's dancing shadow. I found it! I found it! He whispered. Oak nodded. You did good, Sid. You did so good. The well rose up tall in the middle of the oak, and it was different from most wells. Instead of stones or bricks, knobbly tree roots wrapped themselves round one another to form the sides. Who put it here? Mal asked. Oak was silent for a few seconds. I don't think anyone did. I think it's always been here, since the beginning of time. Like the bone murmur? Alfie said. Griff sprang up onto the well's edges, his whiskers twitching as he looked inside. Holding their breath, the others peered in after him. The well had only about 30 centimetres of water inside, but somehow the water looked different, strange. It was glowing turquoise, like a shimmer of falling stars. I can see roots at the bottom, Alfie whispered. There's nothing in here except strange shining water. Griff was prowling around the top of the well, peering inside. Marl watched him, trying to understand. I think the amulets are inside. We can't see them, though, Alfie said. We can't see anything in there. Siddy frowned but we couldn't see the heart of the forest either. Wincing, Alfie hoisted himself onto the well, but Oak held him back. No, Alfie, not with that ankle. I've got nothing to lose. And before anyone could stop him, Alfie had lowered his body into the well. The glowing water swished around his legs. Feels different, this water. Softer. Or something. Careful, Mole whispered. Gal Alfie gasped. Oh, ah, my ankle! Maul clapped a hand over her mouth. The bandage was unravelling in the water, and beneath it where the wound from the hound's teeth had been, Alfie's skin was now unbroken. His wound had completely healed. It's better! Alfie said in disbelief. Oh, that's the stuff of the old magic, sure enough, Oak whispered. It's what the bone readings of the past talked of, a magic that brings healing to wounds. Alfie balanced his feet on the twisted roots either side of the well. He reached into the belt for his dagger. Thrusting it into the bottom of the well, he heaved it through the roots until eventually water began to slip between the gaps. In minutes, he had cut a circle nearly as wide as the well itself. More water gushed through the slits. He punched the circle with his foot, and it swung away. There was a sudden rush as the rest of the water drained from the well, plunging down somewhere far beneath Alfie's feet. He looked up and grinned. Then he slipped through the hole and was lost in the shadows for several seconds. When he emerged, he looked back at them, wide-eyed. "'You aren't going to believe this!' Maul lowered herself into the well, manoeuvring her body through the hole. She couldn't see a thing. 
but she could feel roots jutting out beneath her feet in downward step-like formations, and following her every move she could feel griffs near silent steps. Behind her, Oak struck a match. Goosebumps bristled on Mole's arms. It's, it's not possible. They were standing halfway down a staircase made entirely from twisted roots, which led down into a very large chamber. The room's ceilings arched above them so big it sprawled out behind the light of a match, fading away into shadows. The group edged down the stairs, deeper into the heart of the forest. Oak's match went out and they were smothered by the dark. Water that dripped from the well echoed through the chamber like a leaking bath tap. Oak fumbled in his pocket for another match, but Marl stilled his hand. Wait, I think there's a sort of light in here. She screwed up her eyes at the shadow. A glow, like the water in the well. Follow me. She stepped off the staircase with Griff and ran her hand over a knobbly root that lined the chamber wall. It was cool to touch, so cool it felt to Marl like it might never have been warm. They edged further into the darkness. A flap of wings rushed towards them, and Marl felt the cold breath of a creature rustle through her hair. She shivered, and growl Griff growled as the bat screeched, shaking the silence with its gristly flapping. Then it was swallowed by the dark. Oh, I don't like bats, Siddy muttered, caressing his pocket. Even Porridge the second is scared. Maybe we should turn back. Marl scowled. Shut it, Sid, or I'll get Griff to eat your worm. For a second, Moll's mind wandered to the dream snatch, to skull and hemlock clawing for her mind. Her heart beat faster, drowning out the near-silent sound of Griff's footsteps as he padded further away from her. Moll blinked. She wasn't imagining it. They were shrouded in darkness. But further ahead, the chamber ended, and it was hazily lit by a bluish light, like a winter's mist. Look at the walls at the back of the chamber there, Oak cried. Jutting out from the earth wall, the tree roots were twisted in incredible shapes, and although every root was different, every shape was the same. A mighty head of an enormous stag. Moll gasped. Sixteen points of each of the antlers. Just like you said, Oak, they're carvings of the silver stag, aren't they? The oldest and wisest beast in Tanglefern, Siddy whispered. The beast whose bones make up the oracle bones. Oak reached out and ran a hand over the pointed tip of an antler. All this lying hidden underground. Siddy peered into the mouth of a roaring stag. He shivered, then stepped back. The blue light, where's it coming from? Alfie asked, but Moll hadn't heard him. She whirled around and her heart quickened. Griff, where's Griff? Brrrr. Moll jumped. Griff, where are you? Brrrr. Moll scanned the wall of heads stag's heads, feeling her way towards Griff's call. And then she saw him, sitting very still beneath the head carved from the roots. This one, the one Griff's found. Mal cried, running towards it. It's glowing inside. That's where the light's coming from. Mal, that isn't a silver head sta stag's head. Mal looked at, up at the head, twisting out from the tree roots. It was much bigger than all the others, and the neck was craning over her in a mighty arch. But there were no antlers. The head was rounder, the ears larger, and the mouth opened wide, bearing row upon row of razor-sharp teeth. This was a wild cat, and its eyes were blazing with turquoise light. The Missing Lines, Chapter 32 The eyes were orbs, big and round, burning bluer than the sea amid the roots, two clawed paws jutting out from the chamber wall either side of the wild cat's head, and beneath them sat Griff, staring up at Moll with wide yellow-green eyes. Moll's breath fluttered. Do, do you think the amulets are inside the wild cat? Are they what's making the chamber glow? Siddy peered closer, but the roots are wrapped around each other thick and fast. You wouldn't get your hand inside one of those gaps. Not even you, Moll. He turned to Oak. You'll have to cut them out. Alfie gasped. No, wait. There are letters carved into the root above the wildcat's head. None of the stags have that. Look, here. Moll sprang up to her tiptoes and scanned the words. It says ember. Siddy shook his head. Ember doesn't sound good. Like... Disem dismember, only shorter. He shuddered and looked hopefully towards the exit. We should try mixing the letters up, Alfie said. Remember, Moll, that's what Melantha did. This might be another clue. Moll's mind raced with letters until they became meaningless squiggles. She shook her head. I am no witch doctor. I can't crack it just like that. Griff padded towards Moll and rubbed against her knees. She closed her eyes and tried again. The letters floated before her. She moved them back and forth arranging them into different places, and then suddenly she opened her eyes. I've got two words, she cried, her eyes sparkling, and then there was a tremor in her voice. Ember, backwards, it's rub me. Everyone looked at the wildcat made of roots. 
Rub me? Oak murmured. He ran a hand over the neck of the wildcat. The chamber was silent, as if sucked of air, but nothing happened. Seedy tilted his head to one side and looked at the creature's eyes. Maybe you've got to do it, more. Like with the coin in the door, you're the next guardian of the oracle bones, after all. Maul lifted her hand and ran it very slowly over the wildcat's head. Almost immediately, a tingling sensation pricked through her, as if every hair on her body was standing on end. Although the fur had only been carved out of roots, Maul could feel every individual strand beneath her fingers, and it felt soft and warm, exactly like Griff's coat. Griff curled his tail around her leg, and at that very moment, Maul felt more wildcat than girl. As if she and Griff were linked up in something so tight, not even the bone murmur could explain it. She let her fingers slip over the wildcat's nose, and instead of rough tree roots, the nose felt warm and alive. The warmth spread through Maul's body, and for the very first time in her life, she felt as if she was actually holding magic in the palm of her hand. She edged her hand into the fur of the wildcat's throat, and something extraordinary happened. With a loud crunch, one of the wildcat's front legs moved. Quick as a flash, it clamped down onto Maul's wrist. Oak, Alfie and Siddy jumped backwards. Maul never flinched. Neither did Griff. The wildcat's eyes were blazing. Then from inside the tree roots there came a voice. Deep, soft, like it was part of the tree itself. Maul recognised the voice because it carried within it half-forgotten memories. Memories of her beginning. Maul, Maul, my darling, it said. Maul trembled. Could it be? I'm here, Maul. It's your pa, and I'm here for you, right here. Maul blinked in disbelief. Again, the voice sounded, I've missed you, my girl, so much. Her pa's voice was so real, she could almost touch it. Maul glanced at Oak, who stood beside her, her hand, his hands clasped over his mouth. You're bigger now. And Maul could tell that this voice was smiling, because this was more than just a voice somehow. This was a voice that carried a person with it, a broad-shouldered man, with dark hair and a wide smile. Maul leant hungrily towards the voice. Are you real? The voice laughed. Real? Maul nodded. I'm real, sure enough. But real isn't what you see, Maul. It's what you feel, what you know deep down to be true, even though you've got no proof. An ache swelled inside Maul, part happiness, part terrible loss. You must be real then, she said quietly. Because I can feel you. The voice was smiling again. She could tell. I've never stopped watching over you, Maul. I've been in the leaves when you've been climbing trees. I've been in the river when you've slept, swam. I've been by your side when your sleep's been troubled. Maul willed her voice forward. It was the shadow masks who took you away. And Ma, wasn't it? Her voice is pa. Now Pa's voice was silent for a second. We knew it would come. Maul felt angry tears rising inside her. You knew? And you didn't stop it? It was written, Maul, in the oracle bones before we died. Maul shook her head. The bone murmur says nothing of you leaving. There are two lines missing from the bone murmur, as you know it, Maul. Lost over the years as it passed down through the generations. And it was the missing lines that my dear Olive read in the oracle bones. There was a reason she didn't reveal them. There is a magic old and true that shadowed minds seek to undo. Here, Maul's pa paused, and then he spoke the missing lines. They'll splinter the souls of those who hold the oracle bones from guardians of old. And storms will rise, trees will die, if they free their dark magic into the sky. But a beast will come from lands full wild to fight this darkness with a gypsy child. And they must find the amulets of truth to stop dark souls doing deeds uncouth. Maul's voice was smaller than a whisper. You knew all along and there was nothing you could do. Both your ma and I thought we had more time. We thought we could fight back and find the amulets before the shadow masks struck. Oak shook his head. You should have told me, Ferry. I would have helped. I would have fought with you and Olive. Excuse me. We knew it would be so, Ferry replied. The only way the bone murmur could go on was for us to die. The old magic had to stir and fight back. But the message you read in the Oracle Bones, Maul said, the one to find the amulets, Dewhill Maiden. We followed it, we searched for the heart of the forest for the amulets, and we found you. Fairy laughed. When you look for one thing, you often find another, and then you realise it's the unexpected thing you were looking for all along. Maul led closer to the wildcat, so that only her pa could hear. I think I've been looking for you all along. Even in my dreams, I've been looking. I know, my girl. 
What happened that night by the river ferry? There are things we still don't know. The shadow masks summoned their soul splinter, and though it may have killed me and Olive, it didn't splinter our souls like they hoped. We believed in the bone murmur, and we died for it, so our souls fought back and became the very things the shadow masks fear and hate. Our souls became the amulets of truth. You're the amulet? Ma murmured. And my ma? Is she here too? It's only me, ye ma. I'm the first amulet. Your ma's the second, and the third is an unknown soul. A sudden dread washed over Mal. Aren't the amulets all together? No. The search will take you much further afield than Tanglefern Forest, Mal. Over wild seas and across the remotest mountains. The Shadow Mask's power is growing and their darkness is spreading across the lands. The ancient wood here is just the beginning. Mal's heart sank. The task was widening before her into a dark, forbidding valley. Alfie shifted in the shadows. How can we find the amulets of truth, like the bone murmur says? You are a soul, a voice in the dark. Before amulets become coins, jewels, pennants and the like, they have to have had a story. They have to have counted for something. Each of the amulets of truth contains a soul, and each of these souls is searching for a virtue needed for the old magic to triumph. Virtues that define us as human beings. Once you've shown that virtue, the amulet will be yours. What's the first virtue? Maul said grumly because if it's been polite or thinking before speaking or dressing proper then we're not going to find these amulets fast are we very laughed the first amulet stands for courage for being brave no matter how bad things get because you're not going anywhere in life without bravery everyone was silent and then fairy said oak you've been brave fighting to keep Moll and the whole camp safe since the first day i left alfie alfie lent him closer you've been brave keeping Moll when it meant risking everything Ferry's voice became a whisper, so that only Alfie and Mal could hear, and in finding the amulets, you will learn the truth about your past. Alfie's eyes widened, and Siddy, Siddy bit his lip. It's not my fault I'm scared of bats. Ma born to me that way. Ferry laughed. Siddy, you showed courage, taking my bone reading and leading everyone to the heart of the forest where no one would believe you. Griff protected Mal's every move, even though there are shadow masks out there waiting to take him too. And Maul, my own Maul, you've shown bravery in so many ways. Sneaking to Skull's camp, escaping, following my bone reading, fighting the dream snatch, and keeping going every single day, no matter how frightening things have been. Maul felt tears rolling down her cheeks. The wild cat's paw squeezed tighter on her wrist, and, for a second, the turquoise eyes flashed brown, a deep, dark brown, like polished leather. Maul looked into her pilot's eyes and smiled, and then the burning blue eyes of the wildcat returned. And, all of you, you've won the amulet fair and square, and in a few moments it'll be yours. What have we got to do to beat the shadow masks? asked Maul. Find the last two amulets and destroy the soul splinter. You do that, and you crush the shadow masks, and the bone murmur is saved. The old magic will keep turning. Maul clenched her fists. There's something else, Pa. Why did the shadow masks shave your heads when they came for you? There's something important about that. But I can't work out what. But at that moment there was a crunch and the wildcat's paw lifted from her wrist. Maul could feel her pa slipping away. Don't go, Dad, don't go. Her pa's voice was quieter now. You haven't much time, Maul. The amulet will be yours in a few seconds and later you'll know what to do with it. He paused, his voice quieter still. Mole, never forget you're part of Oak's camp. You do belong. I loved you more than a father could love a daughter, but I wasn't given much time. The others have time, and they're longing to give it to you. So for me, let them in. But I only just got you back. Fresh tears welled. Please don't leave me now. You've a journey in front of you, and a journey's two things. A moving away and in moving towards, in moving away, there's only what is known, and in moving towards, there is hope. This is a journey of moving towards. I'll never really leave you, more. I'm around you every day. And then the wildcat's eyes closed. The chamber back and blackened, and Maul stepped backwards, feeling for Griff. He snuggled close, then the carved wildcat eyes opened again once more. The chamber was flooded with blue light again. A strange grinding noise sounded and very slowly water began to trickle from the wildcat's mouth into a wooden basin beneath it. It felt like rumbles of faraway thunder and then there was another sound and it cut into the rumble as clear as a wind chime. The clatter of something hard dropping into the basin. 
There, glittering under the carved wildcat, lay the most spectacular jewel Mole had ever laid eyes on. Cinderella Bull had rubies as red as royal robes and emeralds as deep green as the forest leaves, but this jewel was something else. The amulet, Mole whispered, hardly daring to breathe. Every blue sparkled from this jewel, sapphire, cobalt, cobalt, cerulean, navy and indigo. Azure, iris and teal sparkled from the jewel and danced up and down the walls of the chamber like a turquoise rainbow trapped underground. The jewel was encased in silver and not moon silver this time. The real thing. There was a chain with links as fine as spider silks fashioning the whole thing into a necklace. Moll reached into the water and held it in her hand. It was cold and heavy, as if many untold secrets had been locked inside it. She slipped it over her head as part of her paw right there with her. Her eyes narrowed. Now we've got it. We're going for skull. That's when the footsteps started, hesitant at first, then louder, faster, like a torrent of water rushing towards them. And that's where I'm going to leave it. We've only got a few, well, 20 pages left, but I need a bit of a break. I'll see you in a bit.